so I wanted to look at the very mantle bearer that, that Pastor Therese spoke about last week, which was the prophet Elisha. Uh, the title for this message is Maturing Within Your Mantle. Picking up the mantle is such a, an amazing moment. It is such a mind-blowing moment. It's such an epic moment that a lot of times we tend to think that picking up the mantle is the end. But actually, picking up the mantle is the very beginning of the next level of transformation and revelation that God has for you. And so I want to look at this process as it was navigated by the prophet Elisha. When we find the prophet Elisha, just to quickly backtrack, he has asked for a double portion. Oh, the boldness in that. He's asked for a double portion of, the, of the, the spirit with which Elisha carried the very mantle that God gave him, and he received it. And now it's time for him to walk this thing out. I want to actually start in uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. And so he's just received his mantle. And of course, with receiving a mantle, there are, hmm, how can I put it? There is supernatural privilege that comes with your mantle that you did not have before your mantle. And so we find the prophet Elisha navigating how to work within and deal with these, with the supernatural privilege. It says, then he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. I don't understand why that was insulting. I'm bald. I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> so he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. I said the same thing. Wow. <laughs> I mean, for a prophet of the Lord, he's, he's rolling kind of grisly. No pun intended. I didn't even mean to say it like that. <laughs> I mean, whoa. So he's just received his mantle. And we find him in this encounter. Now, there are a number of things to take a look at in this encounter, which I think will help us all as we take on our mantles and get used to the responsibility of wearing and, and carrying the mantle and who we are and who we're supposed to be as we have it. The first thing you notice is that he's going up the road and it says some youths. Right there, that is an indication that there needs to be a mind switch. When you pick up your mantle, many people will come at you and say the craziest things. They will just say the craziest things about you. Now these youths, all they said to him was that he was bald-headed. It was true, he was bald. One difference to note, the prophet Elijah, his predecessor, was known as a very hairy, hairy man. And so, knowing that the prophet Elijah was as anointed as he was, it's very hard to have someone, as you're stepping into your own calling as you are, stepping into your own mantle, compare you unfavorably to the previous person who was there before you. But how many of us know we were not made to look exactly alike? Every single person is made and created completely, uniquely, and different. So if someone says, well, you know, the person who spoke before you, Eb, was six foot two. You're only five foot ten. Am I really going to get offended by that? It's the truth. I am five foot ten. That doesn't mean the anointing is any less or any more. It's not a comparison thing. You understand what I mean? We can't get caught up in this idea that now that we've picked up the mantle that has been laid down, we have to immediately be compared to the person before us. Because that doesn't serve anyone. The whole point of the mantle being put down was, was for us to pick it up as who God is going to make us into. And that's someone completely different. So we find the prophet Elisha, and whereas Elijah was a very hairy man, Elijah's, Elisha is bald. In this time period, 
he took this as an insult. And there are any number of reasons in, as to why he was insulted by being called bald. It was said in the time period that for those who suffered from leprosy, which was a disease of the skin, you'd have to shave your skin. And so people who shaved their heads were known perhaps as people who suffered from the disease of leprosy or lepers. So that's one possibility. There's any number of reasons. There are many passages in the Bible which speak to hair, the growth of hair as a sign of wisdom. We also know that Samson, who grew his hair in a Nazarite, a Nazarite vow, his hair was a sign of his, was a, the source of his strength. So there are a number of reasons as to why in this particular moment being called bald-headed offended him. But what he chose to do with being offended is where we need to learn from. I love that it's, it's, it, the entire exchange started from youths. So this speaks to people who are inexperienced. So as you've picked up your mantle and you're moving forward, be very careful with listening to people who lack the experience that you are now going to, giving you commentary on how you are supposed to navigate what God has given you. Because people who lack experience are quick to have opinions. They're not carrying your mantle. It's very easy to have an opinion when you are not carrying the mantle that the person is carrying. So watch out for people who will comment on how it is you are carrying your mantle because truly it is none of their business. So he said, and he turned around, he looked at them, he pronounced the curse on them in the name of the Lord. The bears came out and mauled him. Now, another thing about youths, I used to teach. Children will say crazy things. Crazy things. Can you imagine if I walked into a classroom and a child said something crazy about me and I just called two bears on them to just maul them on the spot? <laughs> you just cannot do this. Forget the kids. At some point, I'd be out of bears. <laughs> I wouldn't have any bears left to maul kids. There'd just be, it would just be crazy have to be mindful that when people insult you, you can't just take it at face value, get all offended, get in your feelings, and then just call forth this. But this speaks to the immaturity that Elisha is in the midst of right now. Now, mind you, he has his mantle. Just because we have our mantle does not mean we still don't have to grow. Now we have to navigate the process of maturing underneath the weight of a mantle. And this is a completely different type of maturity process than the one we're used to than before the mantle was there. So the first thing we, think we see in terms of having to mature from within your mantle, the first thing that we will see is that you have to mature in disposition. Your disposition has to change. We cannot afford to be the same person we were before we picked up the mantle during our process with the mantle. Our disposition has to change. We have to be different people. We have to be thicker skinned. Because as we can see, it didn't take very long for Elisha to carry his mantle for commentary and insults to be hurled at him. But this is the way he chose to deal with it. What we have to then realize is there is a period of growth within carrying your mantle. And that is okay. We cannot allow ourselves to doubt ourselves when we find out portions of who we are that are unfavorable, yet we're carrying the mantle, and then we get into a, a, a situation where we're saying, well, I'm carrying this mantle, so I can't possibly be. No, this is who you are, and now it's time to deal with it and evolve from it. We can't run away or shy away from the things inside of us that have been there before the mantle, but we do have to confront them and deal with them. 
And so this is Elisha at the, very, at the very beginning of carrying his mantle. He apparently is very hot-headed, and he's very impulsive. And that is probably some of us. Oh, nobody wanted to claim that. <laughs> whether it is some of us on a regular basis or some of us once in a while or some of us very rarely, we will catch ourselves in moments where we have an impulse to say or to respond quickly. And when you're carrying a mantle, which is an incredible responsibility because it is so much bigger than just who we are and what we're doing in that moment, every mantle that is assigned to every one of you carries a responsibility of generations to come. It carries the responsibility of the very youths who might be insulting you. So we don't have the luxury or the grace to just call bears on every youth that insults us. But we'll see where he evolves to from here. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6. Now when we've met Elijah, as you've seen, he's very angry, he's an impulsive person, quick to call upon a curse, and not really think about what happens from there. Now, Elijah, Elisha then moves forward, and according to the, the mantle that he's carried, he has supernatural encounter after supernatural encounter after supernatural encounter. And this particular one is one most of us are very familiar with. Most of us have heard of the passage of how the prophet Elisha was under attack, and he says, Look out, into the, look out into the mountains. There's more of them than there are. More, we have more help than they do, basically. So it says, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And so he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. We're going to come back to that particular section, put a pin in that. But the next section, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Can we go to verse 18? And when the Syrians came to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. Now let's look at this very carefully. The Elisha we met a few chapters ago was walking down the road. He was encountered by youths. They hurled a couple of insults at him, and he called bears on them to maul them. This Elisha, to set the stage, is in a village minding his business. And the king of Syria has decided he's going to wage war on the kingdom of, of Israel. But every time the king of Syria makes a move, the prophet Elisha warns the king of Israel and they manage to evade the attack. So the king of Syria just gets upset and says, where is this prophet? I've got to find him and find him now. So he sends a group of people, they find where he is, and he sends a small army after him. Now what's interesting is this army didn't just show up. This army showed up and camped out all night. They couldn't wait to attack this man. So when he wakes up early in the morning, he steps outside. He hasn't had breakfast. He's just woken up. He's just getting some fresh air. And he looks out, and he sees a city surrounded by an army. Has the presence of mind to say, clearly I know that I'm equipped and I'm protected. But look. It says, when he looked to the mountains, there were chariots of fire and horses. Yet, when it was time for him to do whatever he needed to do with this army that approached him, he struck them with blindness. Now, if I was still angry, and if I was still impulsive, and I had an army of chariots, of fire, and horses, and the enemy approaches me, what do you think I'm going to do? We're calling the chariots of fire and the horses on them. 
Yet, a mature, a mature Elisha, who has now learned how to carry his mantle and the responsibility of that which he calls upon that comes from God, does something strategic. He strikes them with blindness. There's a huge difference between the Elisha who just picked up the mantle and this Elisha that we see now. This Elisha has figured out how to use the power that he calls upon from God for a much longer term and less violent purpose. Family, we have to learn under our mantle how to wield the power that God has blessed us to have and the mantle that God has called us to have, called us to have strategically. There has to be forethought. We do not have the luxury to continually act out of a place of flesh to make decisions when we are under duress. Because the excuse that we will give ourselves is, well, I was attacked. I'm under duress. I need to call forth everything. All I'm going to marshal all of God's, God's forces and the army. And, and that doesn't always have to be. It reminds me a lot of uh, the, the Sons of Thunder. It was James, I believe, James and John of Zebedee. And they had an encounter where they were walking, there's two of the disciples, they were walking with Jesus. Jesus entered a town, and the town didn't receive Jesus properly. In other words, they didn't greet him the way they felt Jesus deserved to be greeted. And the first thing these two men wanted to do was to call down fire from heaven and burn the village. Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not how we do things. I didn't come to take life, I came to give it. Your mantle, your responsibility is not to take life, but to give it. And that's where the maturity in disposition comes from. The decisions we make ultimately are to give life. Every decision we make is to expand and give life, to pour life into the circumstance, to pour life into the situation, to pour life into the people that we're dealing, it, dealing with. That is a sign of the maturity of carrying that mantle. We'll move on to 2 Kings 6, 21 through 23, and we'll see the, how this all plays out. Because he struck them with blindness for a very specific reason. He strikes them with blindness so that he can have them wind up in a completely different city. So he blinds them, and then he says, I'm going to lead you now to where you want to go. Now, mind you, they are after the prophet Elisha. He strikes them blind. They can't see who's leading them. And so he says, well, the guy you're looking after, I'm going to take you to him. And he winds up taking, him before, taking this army from Syria to the king of Israel, presents them in the court. He says, now, when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Who is this guy? <laughs> this is clearly not the same person who mauled youths with two bears. He's under attack, under siege by an army, and not only does he not lay a finger on them, not only does he leave the chariots of fire and the horses in the mountains, he just strikes them with blindness and leads them away. And then he feeds them and sets them on their way. This is maturity of disposition at its greatest. When you get to a place where you are under duress and your enemies come towards you, and you can bless them? And I don't mean bless them from a place of, well, I was out of weaponry anyway, so it was the only thing I could do. <laughs> That's a different thing altogether. He had every weapon at his disposal, and he still blessed them. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and after they ate, they drank, he sent them away, to their, and they went to their master. 
So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more to the land of Israel. Now, had he decided to call forth the fire, the chariots of fire and the horses, he wipes out this portion of the, of, the, of the Syrian king's army. Do you know what's going to happen? He's going to send some more of the army. This is strategy. There are times to fight, and there are times to call forth everything that you have at your disposal from heaven. And then there are times where with no bloodshed, with no casualties, you not only deal with the conflict now, but your solution is so strategic that it has eliminated the problem permanently. That is where we need to be when we have our mantles. It's not enough to just wipe out the enemy on the spot. Guess what? More enemy will show up. The very source of the enemy strife that you're dealing with, we'll just send more and more and more and more and more. With this scenario, it says, the, the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Done. And nobody had to die. So as we are maturing into carrying these mantles, we have to get to a place where we are out of our feelings and we're so in tune with the Spirit of God that decisions aren't always impulsive. And the decisions that we make have long-standing benefit and blessing for not just ourselves, but for others. And yes, to take it to the next level for our enemies too. So the first thing what we'll see that we'll have to do is we'll have to mature in disposition. The second thing we will have to mature in is our faith. See, it's one thing to change who we are, to change how we deal with conflict, to change how we deal with situations, to change our temperament. The next level of that is our faith has to change. So I actually want to go back to 2 Kings 6, uh, 20, I'm sorry, 17 and 18. I want to go back to that passage. And this is the passage where Elijah tells the person with him to look into the mountains. It says, and Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The level of faith that it takes to be under attack on this level and fierce attack. Now, he walked up and just, he's surrounded. The level of faith that it takes to be surrounded by enemy encounter and still take your eyes and do this. Oh, okay, I, I see. Lord, I see my army. One chariot, two chariot, three chariot. Ooh, these chariots are on fire. This is going to be good. And now you can look forward. That's different. Most of the time when we get encountered with an overwhelming level of enemy presence, the first thing we do is we focus on what's around us. Not realizing that our vision is now here. All, we, all we're doing is panning on the same level and we're strategizing, but we're strategizing on a lower level. Yeah. I can deal with this. I can deal with this. Da, 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 da. I'm going to do this. Da, 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 da. Okay, I'm going to do that. Da, 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 da. And all of this is coming from our strength. All of this is coming from the limits of our imagination. All of it is coming from the limits of our intellect. All of it is coming from past experienced battles. Our strategy on this level is limited only to what we've experienced before. But what happens when what you've experienced before is completely different from what you experience now? Now you're fighting a different battle. And so the level of faith that it took the prophet Elisha to keep his eyes up and to tell the person behind him, you need to look up too. And he did. And he prayed to God, and that man's eyes was opened. It's not enough 
for only us to see the vision. We have to have enough faith that we can look up and see the vision and get other people behind us who are looking towards us for leadership to do the same thing. That's a completely different level of faith altogether. That's the faith that is working outside of you in such a huge way that it's literally grabbing on to the people around you. That's next level faith. So this is where the prophet Elisha is in this circumstance. But the question then becomes, how does he get there? How do you get to a place where your faith is so great that you're under attack and you don't even look at the enemy? Your perspective is so lofty, you don't even regard the enemy. He never actually even responds to the army. He doesn't even commentate on the army whatsoever. He says, what are we going to do? He says, look up. Look in the mountains. Look at who we have. And does not look down to regard them in any way, shape, or form other than to pray that they're blind. So I want to look at another section of Elisha's journey to see how exactly he gets here. I want to go to 2 Kings 4. Now to set this up, the prophet Elisha has, has walked into the city of, uh, I believe it's Shun, Shuna. He encounters a Shunammite woman who is extremely generous and extremely hospitable to him. This is important because understand that taking on your mantle and embracing your mantle, in doing that, there is provision, there is protection, and there is hospitality that awaits you if only you would take up your mantle and walk. So he starts walking. He winds up in this city, and this woman sees him, and he walks by, and for whatever reason, the woman goes to her husband and says, hey, that's, that's a man of God. I need you to prepare some bread for him. We're going to prepare a room for him. So every time he comes into this city, he will have some place to lay his head. He didn't know this was going to happen when he walked. He just started walking. Now he's found himself with a place to rest. Now, from having a place to rest, from, con from having this hospitality extended to him continuously, he asks his servant, he says, servant, this woman, this Shun Shunammite woman, bring her over here. Calls over here, what do you need? What is it that you want? And she says, you know, I'm taken care of, I'm fine. And he says, you're going to have a child. This Shunammite woman, who did not know the power that Elisha possessed, all she knew was to be hospitable. To flip the perspective around, we've been looking at this from the perspective of carrying the mantle. I want to flip this around to how you view those who are carrying their mantles. Bless them because you never know when they're going to bless you. She encounters this prophet, sets up a place for him in her house. He has somewhere to lay his head. He calls her over and says, you're going to have a child. So she has this child. And the child wakes up one day, has headaches. And her husband brings the child over. The child dies. So this woman gets on a horse, rides out to Mount Carmel to find this man of God because she knows that this man has power. Don't be surprised when people come out to seek you because they know you have power. She had no idea what to what extent his power was. She just knew that there was a man of God who was carrying his mantle. You'll be shocked what a marker it is for you to walk and carry your, just carrying your mantle alone. People will I don't want to say assume, but they will be drawn to you because they know that there is a solution within you that you might not even be aware of. And now power is going to be drawn out of you that you have not used before. 
And now you're not only blessing the person who is receiving the gift of this power, but you've learned something about the extent of God's power within you as well. So she approaches Elisha. So, so she said, did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I, did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Jehazi, that's his assistant, get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him, but lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Jehazi went ahead of them, laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. I'm going to pause right there. Now, this is a man of great power. This is the same man who had enough vision and enough faith to cast his eyes upon mountains and have a, at an army of incredible strength at his disposal. So he's met with this problem. This woman says, I need my child to be healed. And he thinks he's solved it. He says, well, the anointing is on me. The presence of God is with me. I'm carrying my mantle. If you just take my staff and lay it on the boy's face, he should be fine. And yet nothing happens. One of the mistakes we make with carrying our mantle is this idea, this notion that we know how God's going to work. Once we pick up the mantle and we've worked with it and we've experienced some things and we've been through supernatural encounter after supernatural encounter, we all of a sudden we think that we're in the flow of God's routine. Like, I know how this is going to work. I'm going to do this and bam, that's going to happen. I'm going to do this, bam, this is going to happen. What I mentioned earlier was that one of the maturing things that happens is our faith has to mature. And this experience is where the maturity of faith for Elisha takes place. Because here he is walking in his anointing, and he places this in the staff that he has as placed on this child, and nothing happens. What do you do? We cannot afford to become disenchanted or disillusioned or despondent when we put forth an effort and things don't go the way we expect them to go. Imagine this. He sends the staff. The child has not awakened. So what walking in our mantle teaches us is we have to always be prepared for an unexpected outcome. That is the very essence of walking in alignment with God. It's not knowing what he's going to do and just following it. It's being so submitted to him, having so much faith in who he is that you have no idea what is about to happen. And you still continue forward anyway. And you don't put down the mantle because you become disappointed that I did this one thing and oh my God, this healing didn't take place, this supernatural encounter didn't take place, this blessing that I expected didn't happen, the person I wanted to bless wasn't blessed, so clearly I'm not worthy of the mantle, put it down. No. And too many times, too many leaders, too many mantle bearers get trapped in the disappointment of one experience, the disappointment of one encounter. And by disappointment, we have an expectation. And then there's God's reality. And those two just happen to not meet at that one point in time. And now we mad. And we don't want to do it anymore. God, this ain't fair. We have to understand, we, maturing in faith means the unexpected outcome, not only does it not phase us, we expect the unexpected. We, look so, we, we are so comfortable with what God is going to do and not knowing what God is going to do that when he does it and we're surprised, most people can't tell. It's like, did you expect that? No, I did not. <laughs> I had no idea that was going to happen. I knew God was going to show up, because he always does. I knew I was going to be a part of it, because, well, I'm here. 
But how it was going to come forward, no idea. And we have to become comfortable with that. It says, now Jahazi went ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child. Can we go to the next verse, please? When Elisha came to the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. He went in, therefore, shut the door behind the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands, and stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. Now, he's already sent his staff. That didn't work. Now, I don't know about you all, but I don't know how I would react if God said, I need you to lay <laughs> on this child, and I need you to, not, I mean, like face to face. Eyeball to eye, how do you even do that? <laughs> eyeball to eyeball, I mean, this is odd. This is definitely out of the norm, but God exists well outside of the norm. He went up and he lay on the child. He put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands, and the child became warm. Let's go to the next verse. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. I'm going to pause right there. One of the enemies to maturity that we don't realize is progress. He laid himself out, he stretched himself out on the child. He said the child became warm. The goal or the outcome that was desired was not for a warm child, it was for a live child. If we're going to continue forward carrying the mantle that God has blessed us to have, we can't afford to allow a little bit of progress to let us get complacent. said the child became warm. Well, I would imagine the child was warm. He was laying on him. <laughs> what doesn't mean the child is alive? See, sometimes we get so used to flowing and walking with the mantle that a little bit of progress happens, and instead of continuing forward with what we're supposed to do, we say, job done. I've done enough. I've done just enough to say I've put forth an effort. There was a result. Not the result, but there was a result. And it was a positive result. I mean, this was more than the, the Shunammite woman could have possibly expected. Yet, we see Elijah continue. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. That is what he was after. But in order to get what he was after, he had to first send his staff, and he had to next literally in bring his presence forward in full, not once, but twice. The amount of faith that it takes to be able to do one thing and have it not work and do a second thing and have that not work and then have God tell you the same thing that you did before that didn't work, do it again. Yeah. Note the encounters. Because it's one thing when you do something and it doesn't work and then you, the, the common sense says, try something different. That makes sense. And he tried that and something happened. He made progress. It's another thing to when you Try and you put forth that effort and it fails. And God says, go do the same thing again. How many times have you sent that resume out to the same company? You sent it the first time. They said no. You sent it the second time. They said no. And now God has the nerve to tell you, send it again. I've been working on that person who's receiving your resume. Send it again. 
the person who was blocking your progress, I've removed them unbeknownst to you. Send it again. Take a look at your resume. You're not giving yourself enough credit. You need to redo your resume and add some things because you have more power in you than you knew you had and you need to document it and then send it again. Faith building experience. This experience right here is what matured Elisha's faith to get to the place where he was now walking consistently supernaturally. Everything that happens from this moment forward, he doesn't have this encounter again where he does one thing and it doesn't work. Everything that happens from this point, it just worked. To the point where he is now encountered by enemies and he does not, he's not even phased. He's like, listen, I've laid on a child. <laughs> and the child sneezed seven times and said, hey. You think I'm scared of you? No. We have to remember that the experiences, that the quote unquote disappointments that we may experience as we carry our mantle are faith building exercises at work. And the third thing, the last thing I want to impress upon you is actually something that's touched on in this very, very section. In order to successfully mature under your mantle, you have to have persistence. It is requirement. You have to be persistent. Because everything, as I said earlier, is not going to look the way you want it to look. It's not going to go the way you want it to go. It's not always going to go according to the bullet points of your plan. And yet and still, we have to still have the level of persistence in us that says, no, I'm not putting down my mantle. I'm still going to move forward through this. And if you look at Elisha, his whole ministry was marked by persistence. If you remember last week, uh, Pastor Tere talked about his first encounter where he received his mantle. The prophet Elijah, his predecessor, was leading him and at some point, the prophet Elijah, knowing he was going to the Lord, said, I need you to stay here because I have to go to this city. I need you to stay here. And he was testing him. But every single time the prophet Elijah tried to leave, the prophet Elisha said, no, 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 no. I'm walking right here with you. At any given point in time, he could have said, you know what? This is the second time he's asked me not to come here. Maybe I shouldn't be there. No, he was so focused on receiving that which we, he knew he had a claim on, he said, I'm just going to keep going. Even this encounter here where he is trying to bring this child back to life, if that's not persistence, I don't know what is. And even in his death, the prophet Elisha has an encounter with the king. He's once again under attack. Listen, prophets will be under attack. He was under attack continuously. He finds himself in a situation with a king, and he says, your, your victory is going to be ensured by two things. First, I need you to shoot arrows out of your window in this direction. That ensures that you will hit the enemy a certain amount of times. The king does it. The second thing he tells the king to do is to take the arrows he has remaining. He says, beat them on the ground. That's all he told them to do. Now, mind you, this is the same prophet who, when his predecessor tried to leave him, he refused. He was persistent. This is the same prophet who, when faced with a child, who after two overtures, while he's filled with a double portion of the Holy Spirit, still is not able to revive this child, stay persistent. So he encounters this, this king, and he gives him a very simple direction. This is someone who is marked by persistence. He gives him a simple direction and says, just beat the arrows on the ground. And the king gives it a couple love taps. Three taps. And he says, look, had you kept going, you would have defeated your enemy. But since you only did it three times, you will only strike your enemy three times. Not only do you become marked by your persistence, you start to expect it from others. If you are leading with a mantle, your persistence 
has to be at such a height that it brings that level of persistence out of others. And if it doesn't, you know that these are the people who cannot go with you where you need to go. The responsibility and the weight that is on you when you carry a mantle means you don't have room to drag people who are not as persistent at it as you are. If you're going to mature within your mantle, these three areas have to mature with us. Have to. And right now, you might feel like you're being worked on one in particular. Some of us are probably being worked on all three at the same time. And I know, I know that is hard, but it's absolutely necessary. Because if these three areas are not worked on and they're not matured to where they need to be, the mantle that we're supposed to carry is going to crush us. The first thing that has to mature is our disposition. We cannot be the same person. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a nicer person. It just means you have to be a better version of who you are. There's different ways. God is going to call us to solve problems in different ways. I talked to my wife about, um, she always asks how it is I deal with conflict resolution. And for me, conflict resolution is, is relatively simple. You can see the elements at play if you step back enough and watch. Because when you witness a conflict, there are one of two different types. There are people who diffuse the situation. And then there are accelerants, as I like to call them. They're instant gasoline. The minute they show up, everything just <laughs> Nobody was yelling. They show up. People are yelling, throwing things, breaking plates. And like, wait, this was a calm conversation until you showed up. And what we have to learn when we're walking with God in terms of our disposition is one or the other, depending on how God wants to use you. Because sometimes God needs to use you as an accelerant. And it's uncomfortable. Sometimes God, sometimes God needs to use you as a diffuser. And if you're used to being an accelerant in every situation and God is calling you to diffuse, now you're uncomfortable. Yeah. Our disposition has to mature. And not only does it have to change, it has to be flexible enough for God to use us however he sees fit in that moment. <laughs> Second thing that has to mature is our faith. Our faith in how God works and our faith in knowing that we're not always going to understand or know how he's going to do what it is he's going to do. Amen. Faith is, our faith is literally just saying, God, however you want to get this done, I'm in. Amen. And the third thing that needs to be matured within our mantle is our persistence. How we go after a thing has to change. We can't be the king who only taps on the ground three times. We have to be the king that is willing to beat on the ground with those arrows till those arrows break, pick up the shards, and keep beating until we're told not to beat on the floor anymore. We have to be persistent. Because that persistence will attract others around you who are equally as persistent, if not more. And you'll find yourself in the midst of people who might be hungrier than you. And they grow you up. And they mature your persistence. We're at a very amazing time right now. Mantles being picked up. And I want to make sure that we are all equipped to know that the mantles that we pick up are not there to weigh us down. And if we're maturing in these three areas, not only will they not weigh us down, we'll carry them effortlessly. Most people won't even realize we have a mantle on us. We're just walking with such authority, it doesn't look like there's anything on our shoulders. So I want to make sure we're working on these things 
I want to make sure we're allowing God to work in us on these things. Because God will prick one of these at any given moment. Find yourself in a leadership moment. And, oh, mm, I don't want to deal with my disposition right now. I'm a calm person. I don't want to be righteously angry. I just want to be calm and at peace. I just want to be in peace all the time. Peace, peace, peace. Not always what needs, what is needed to get the job done. Let's stand. Now this morning, some very hungry people walked in here saying, wherever you take me, I will follow you. I heard a good deal of you pouring that out from your hearts. Wherever you take me, I'll follow you. Live stream, your presence was evident. Wherever you take me, I'll follow you. And I understand what it is like to pick up a mantle and be like, what's going on? <laughs> Who am I now that I have this mantle? I understand the journey. We're all on that journey. And I want to make sure that everyone who leaves this morning understands, number one, not only are you not alone on that journey, but that mantle that you're carrying right now that you think is so heavy and you think it's so awkward and you don't know if it fits you. Yeah, it's awkward. That's, that's the truth of it right now. But, yes, it fits you. That mantle that you picked up, that's yours. It was tailor-made, it was express-made to your specifications. And the authority that comes with it fits you. The responsibility that comes with it fits you. And all of the glory that that mantle carries, that ultimately goes back unto God, was meant to travel specifically through you. I want everyone to leave this morning understanding the process of being a mantle bearer and knowing that you were selected. Your mantle didn't fall on you. It was placed at a very specific place at a very specific time for you to pick it up. And once you have picked up that mantle, it's yours. And it's supposed to be yours. I want to call a few people up to this altar. If you've picked up your mantle, and if you're honest, like real with yourself, you're struggling with it. You're struggling with it. You have your mantle. You're not quite sure how to even put it on. Does the, my arms go here? Does it go over my head? Does it, it just feels awkward. If you are carrying your mantle and you know that you are not 100% comfortable in it yet, come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Yeah. You're walking in it. You know it. You know you have your mantle. You know it. But you're a little uncomfortable in it. Come on down. Come on down. next group of people that I want to call forward for anyone who has had their mantle at some point in their journey and decided because God challenged you in your disposition or God challenged you in your faith or God challenged you in your persistence and you put the mantle down because it was a challenge you felt you weren't ready to accept. Because it was a challenge you didn't know you were equipped to handle. For anyone who I will say temporarily
put that mantle down because God came at you with those three things that just needed to be matured. I want you to come forward because now you're equipped. Come forward. Come forward. Come forward. Y'all know me, I love challenges. I don't want anyone to leave this room having had their mantle challenged and put it down because they didn't realize that challenge was there to build you and to grow you. Come on down. Hmm. Wow, mantle bearers. Y'all look awesome. Third group of people I want to call down in order to walk this thing out, in order to really be able to understand what carrying your mantle means, to be able to navigate it so that you are not only comfortable, but your mantle literally becomes who you are. Gotta have an open and honest and challenging and bold relationship with God. If you know right now that that open and honest and bold and challenging relationship with God is not in place yet, if you haven't put that first foot forward to say, God, let's have this chat, let's have this conversation about what you see for me, about who you see that I am. If you have not opened your heart, if you haven't opened the door, to allow God in to begin this bold and amazing and challenging part of your life where you walk with him and you walk for him. Come forward. Come on down. Come on. Come on. Come on down. It takes one to know one. I used to be one. Come on down. You ain't alone. Thank you. If you want to begin that love affair with God that reveals mantles right now, come on down. Come on. I'll wait. Come on down. Father, this very morning, you issued the challenge of accepting and navigating a journey with the mantle you prepared for us. And every person at this altar, every person who is willing, every person on live stream, every person who will be receiving this message second, third, fifth hand through whatever technology is available, Lord God, anyone who hears these words and encounters this experience, we all say yes to your challenge. We say yes to the glory and the power of walking with your mantle upon us. And we say, God, every area within us that needs to be matured we receive the authority to allow ourselves to be matured in that area. We receive it and we use that power and we say, Father, work on us. Work on us. Do your work. Wherever you take us, we will follow you. And we will follow you, Father, with our mantles on. Father, this day we receive the power and the portion of our, of our identity that has been missing just because we didn't pick up our mantle or because we put it down. This day we claim the completion of who you purposed and planned for us to be by receiving the journey of maturing under our mantles. We receive that right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, any part of us that does not allow our mantle to fit we remove it right now in the name of Jesus. Any and all excess weight removed right now in the name of Jesus. 
any portion of the spirit, Lord God, that does not allow your mantle to rest upon us as it was ordained to from the beginning of time. Whatever portion of our spirit, of our mind that is, we eradicate that thing right now in the name of Jesus. Father, our minds are committed to you. Our hearts are committed to you. Our spirit is committed to you. And this day, we all say, yes. We say yes to being matured under your mantle. And Father, we lift you in advance and say thank you for allowing your glory to pass upon us, around us, and through us. And thank you, Father, for opening our eyes to our worthiness of what you have made for us. In Jesus' name, amen.